Thank you, Stephanie, for that kind introduction. It's an honor to be part of this launch of this beautiful book. And thanks to Trinity University Press for hosting us and, and publishing this book. And thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us in this celebration. We'll be taking audience questions. Um, so if you have them, please post them in the Q&A section. We'll definitely talk about them at the end and I'll try to um, bring a few in throughout if possible. So um, let's start with, with some questions. Um, I'd love to start with the beginning, Suzanne. Um, I wanna hear the origin story. And you set out, and I appreciate how in the preface you set out to explain your journey. So could you tell us a little bit more of this project's origin? Uh, where did this idea come from for the whole project? And what did you hope to achieve? What was your purpose? Well, first I wanna thank you, Jim, for doing this interview or this chat. And I wanna thank Trinity University Press for for their faith in this project and, and, and creating such a wonderful book from my writing and art. Um, the origin story, you know, that's, I love that way you put it, the origin story, because this, this book really does have, uh, the origin is, is extremely important. And that's, as Stephanie said, that the, the, the um, art project I started with called Notes on the State of Virginia, which was Jefferson's only book. And um, so I did this, an art project between 2011 and 2013 first. So this may be the only book in which the writing came second and the writing illustrates the artwork instead of, instead of the opposite way around. Um, so, so uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about the process. Um, when I was, uh, starting, to, I get this idea that I was gonna redo uh, this idea of notes on the state of Virginia. And I would go from the Atlantic to the Appalachians and find ecologically and interesting and culturally interesting places. Um, uh, I had to decide on which sites to visit. And so let's start with a, 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 a picture of me on site. This shows me typical form uh, <laughs> outside with a lot of mosquito buddies that you don't see in the picture. Um, so uh, my husband, Dan, loves this picture because it really shows <laughs> what I went through sometimes to, to draw. But at every single place that I would visit in Virginia for the art project, I would draw and I would take voluminous notes and I would collect objects um, and create, a, you know, a feeling about, explore to one day create a work on the piece and about the place. I never knew exactly what I was going to be uh, going to be doing with it all. So when I took all the stuff to my studio, this is like bottles of water, of, of water and sand and clay and turtle shell and a wasp nest and bugs. And you can see my sketchbook in the back there. Um, I just said, I, I would bring it all back to my studio. And here's a picture of me in my studio painting the Chesapeake Bay um, on a piece of plexiglass. And um, the next picture shows me putting together some pieces. And you can see the leaves and you can see some of the finished maps on the back of the wall, some of the finished assemblages I did, they all started with a topographical map with a pin marked in the exact site that I went to. And then I'd start to layer them with, oh, sketches, sometimes unclear mylar um, and paintings and found objects. And then after 26 pieces were done, after in the 26 um, places I visited, I had an exhibit which kept me going around Virginia again. So this is a picture of one of the exhibits and you can see the, uh, the larger assemblages were on full-size topo maps. The smaller ones were on pieces of it and, and sometimes mirror and all sorts of, of uh, materials. In one, ex in one exhibit, the William King Museum of Art, they created um, 
a large map. Uh, next slide. A large map of Virginia and made miniature reproductions of each piece showing where that piece, that assemblage related to the place in Virginia. So um, that said, what the book does is tell the backstory behind the site visits, the travel, meeting people. You can see here, this is a, you know, the way every chapter opens, you see on the left, um, the actual assemblage and a little map of Virginia, a little state shape of Virginia showing you where I was in Virginia for that, um, in that chapter. And in each chapter I tell how I made it, um, the, you know, stories about people, all sorts of, all sorts of things um, that I couldn't say in the, in the actual assemblage. Great, terrific, thank you. So, so um, I think it's the second chapter talks about your, your daily rituals, your daily practice. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear, and that's a great chapter to, to include early in a book. And it's a great way to, to make us think about our own daily rituals and our own approach to the natural world. So I'd like to hear a little more about, um, I'd like to hear you describe this ritual, this, that, how you go about your daily life? Well, what, that was a that's that's right, Jim. That that was a good one to put at the beginning because it kind of introduces you to to my my everyday life. Um, it's a chapter also where I show my rituals in in art, and also I introduce my partner in life in art, the poet Dan Strike, who um, figures in that packet in that chapter quite a, quite a bit and his passion for art and, and fantastic forms in, in nature. Um, and I, I talk about the ritual of, of walking, um, walking in, on the hill in back of my house with my sketchbook. Um, can we show the daily observations piece? So here you have the map uh, and the, the pin is, is hardly visible, but it's up at the top where my home would be. You have the map, you have the leaves and uh, the sketches printed on clear mylar. And what's important to me is that I keep grounded. I, I, do, I do very idea oriented art too, but I always like to keep in touch with the actual earth, the birds singing, who is nesting right now? Who's migrating through? Um, you know, what, what, watch the millipedes crawling around the leaf litter. I like to keep absolutely in tune with my source, as you might say. I want to show you um, a, a sketchbook. Um, this is the size of my normal sketchbook slide off. Okay, so um, these are, this is a typical sketchbook and I have lots and lots of notes at the back. So when I started to write the book, can you see that? Maybe not, but you get the sense how, how intimate it is. It's not some great big sketchbook. This is the kind of book I can stick in my pack and my even in my purse and carry around with me and record things that I see and think. Um, and so here's a, a I always write and draw in each page. Um, so when I came to do that daily observations piece, I put, took, um, can we have the detail? Um, I took the, my sketches and printed them on clear mylar and put them right over the map that you can see. And then there's a little black snake uh, over to the left um, and a, a salamander that we observed in a vernal pool uh, one night. You know, all different things that I saw around my home. You know, recently 
I realized that I layered the assemblages, I layer experiences, and I layered uh, the chapters as well. That I realized that there's something collage-like or assemblage-like about the chapters. They, they cover so many different kinds of things. And I'm very aware of how uh, we look at nature, we look at in, and each other even, we, and we only see certain things. There's so many layers that we don't see. We just can glimpse the layers. And it's interesting how, how little we can see of things in depth, but how worth it is to try to see it, to try to understand it. Yes, I, I, yes, I really appreciate that. So I'm gonna incorporate uh, a couple questions from the, the Q&A and chat section. One person, um, Gene Hackett want, wants to know how many illustrations, and I, I want to say there's lots. Just about every page uh, or every other page has some some illustration. And another yeah. person wants to know um, about your the materials you take outside with you on these walks, and then maybe in your studio, what's uh, your favorite uh, tools? What, what are some of your favorite uh, things to work with? Um, if I'm outside hiking, really exploring, it's usually uh, my sketchbook and a pen or a pencil. Um, if I have a place I can set up, like a, a cabin or even just a, a picnic table, sometimes I have a little bit of watercolor. Um, there's one chapter where I set up on my car and I have a little watercolor ready with my with my um uh, brushes. So I have to have some place to carry that kind of material and let it dry. That's another, you know, you have to let it dry before you close the book. Um, and then if I'm near a, where I am right now, or if I can create a, a, a small temporary studio in a cabin or something, um, I can, I can set up painting material. So you can get in my sketchbooks, um, anything from a small pencil sketch to ink, pen and ink to a, a full painting. Uh, and, and now I've, I've revealed the secret. You can tell where I was by what media I use. I rarely use any kind of mixed media. I mean, I mean, a, um, a, a collage in my sketchbook, but I use a lot of, of it in my um, assemblages. Terrific. Um, and two people in the <clears throat> in the Q and A section. One says, um, "This is such a cool project for exploring the state." And I, yeah, that, I really appreciate that too. Um, so I'm going to ask another question um, of my questions, and that um, kind of builds on the last one in terms of um, <clears throat> for you, what is the purpose of art in your life? And you you've touched on this a little bit. Um, but then explore that a little more in terms of uh, the specifics of paint versus painting versus writing. You know, why paint? Why write? And then, and how would you label yourself? You know, are you a writer? Are you a painter? Are you something else? So, um, to answer that, I'd like to read a part of the uh, great the introduction. Great. Um, I write. The painter Milton Avery said, why talk when you can paint? So why do I write when I make, can make visual art? Because I can express different things with each. Nothing compares with the visceral intuitive act of smearing viscous paint or arranging some rusty metal with ripped paper to create a suggestive object. Yet nothing compares with chiseling an experience into words. I sit here now tapping on the keys because of the rush I get making a short thought into a long one because of the way habitats and characters, human or non-human, might be resurrected. Write, writing pushes me to grapple with my own sundry thoughts as I birth them onto the page, the way a gooey larva becomes a fully formed honeybee. And like that honeybee, perhaps both my art and writing about place form a kind of waggle dance. 
I'm here in the hive saying, look, here's the nectar I found. Now go out in the world and find your own. You know, um, can I follow up one thing about that? Um, sure. Uh, sometimes we think there's a certain way to explore. We have to be outdoorsmen or we have to go somewhere that nobody has ever explored before. Um, but that's not true. What we have to do is find ourselves in the place, explore the place, find the other creatures that inhabit that place and let them come into our world and mingle with our both observations, facts, imagination. And this, the epigraph I use for this book is by Wendell Berry. And he says, what you are doing is exploring. You are undertaking the first experience, not of the place, but of yourself in the place. And that was so perfect. That was exactly what I came to realize I was doing. I was exploring myself in that place and honoring all the life that I was discovering. Including, makes, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead, including. Well, I, I, I mentioned natural creatures a lot, but one thing that, that might survive, surprise people who know me is how much I include the people who connect to the place, the naturalists, the, the stewards, the, the, um, the, the farmers, the, the fishermen, you know, all sorts of people who are also connected to that place. That makes me think of two things. The, <clears throat> the chapter you just read from, it sounds like you pretty much every day walk the same path, right? In terms of exploring. So, you know, it, it's not a new place at all to you and yet it is new every day and you are a different person every day and that, that I, I think yeah. that's rich yeah you never walk the same path twice I, you know you 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 want to see something new just walk the same path with eyes yes. open yeah yeah great and 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 the other thing what you just said makes me think of um, one of my favorite chapters was your kind of a tribute, I can't remember the, the man's name, um, the, was he the salamander expert that you spent, or an, an insect expert that you spent a lot of time with in the <clears throat> Natural History Museum and oh, so. Collecting the wild, yeah. Yes. Dr. Yeah. Uh, Richard Hoffman, the yes. late doctor, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that was an interesting experience. Uh, meeting someone at an art exhibit who's looking at so intently at the paintings and then discovering he's an entomologist and, and confessed that he wished he could paint, but he didn't have the patience. <laughs> and, um, and I confessed maybe that I wish I could be a field biology, a biologist, but I had, well, I had a mind that liked to also explore metaphor and, and, meaning and my own meanings and imagination. So I, he admired me because I could try to, I tried to combine science and art. And I admired him because he had so much imagination in his scientific practice. He could go out and imagine what he might find and what might be um, there at a certain time of day or a certain time of of, of the year and, and there's a, quite a bit of imagination in scientific inquiry as well. And that's a nice lead into my next question. Um, and early on, and I love this, the conciseness of this, this sentence, um, you write, evolution is the greatest artist of all. And that gets at the, the relationship between science and art. So, so ex explain or explore that a little more for us, how, how you see those two relating. Yeah, uh, um, you know, I'm absolutely awed by the inventiveness and the beauty of creation, and I could never make anything up to that level. So why then create? Because I think it's also the greatest thing that human beings can do is to explore, explore the natural world. And um, it, 
it's uh, part of our greatest potential to do that kind of interpretation, whether it's scientific or artistic. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's essential. Um, so uh, let, me, let me show you something that I, I've done talking about art and science. Um, there's a piece that I, a uh, painting I did of the millipede. In fact, it was for Dr. Hoffman. And in it, I show a, mil a certain species of millipede in pretty much exactly the way it looks. And I'll tell you, this is interesting because it was going to be seen and eventually owned by Dr. Hoffman, who you mentioned. And I knew I had to get every single leg coming out in the right, in, right scoots. And I knew that there had to be no eyes and um, a certain kind of antenna. So that was very scientifically accurate. But this painting is not about, it's not about identifying the millipede. It's not telling you something about it. It's, it's, it's telling you something about the way we perceive nature. And it's, that's why I use the book page and I put the little holes in the top to show you like it's been ripped out. It shows you that this millipede is being observed by a human and it's, you know, it's being recorded. And the, so the millipede is done exact, in, a, in a very exacting, meticulous way, but the surrounding area is suggestive. It's suggestive of plants, um, but not specific plants. If they were, it would be an illustration of a certain, animal and its environment, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying something more about knowledge and ambiguity and um, the way uh, we experience the natural world in, you know, it, in uh, not with facts and mystery. You can also see a, a string of DNA uh, in the top right section of it. And that's something I often refer to because to me, DNA is like the myth of our time in the sense that a myth that explains reality, it's, it explains our connection to every living thing. And we so often use it for oh, medical reasons or crime solving, but I think we are missing the boat on it. We, it, it also reveals our connection to every living thing on earth. That's great. And I, and I, the illustration you have up now with the millipede, I love how several of your, of these um, main <clears throat> paintings that, that you uh, include in the book are, have some kind of like, like this millipede has the black background. There's like these and you just mentioned the word mystery. There's always kind of this mystery in these, like a door is opening or a window is opening. I really, really love that. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah. And it's and so and I think this. I'm going to incorporate a question from from the audience. So so just as a reminder, if you have questions, please please uh, put them on the Q and A. Um, Matthew Close at, wants to know uh, what determines what artifacts you collect from your surroundings, and I'm guessing mystery gets into that a little bit. Too, but you know what 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 determines what you collect from the surroundings mm. well i suppose size can be put in my bag <laughs> um <laughs> it better be sketched if it's um you know a certain a certain um it, it can't be removed it's alive if it's alive it's not it's going to have to be sketched at the time I occasionally will use photographs because, you know, again, something's living. Um, I love to, t I have all sorts of bags. If I find something that's like a fish skeleton or something, I stick in the bag. Uh, and frankly, I didn't decide um, bef when I was doing the assemblages what I would use. It was I, anything that caught my eye that was fascinating, a beetle husk a leather shoe, square nails, um, you know, they just have a, have some a kind of um, visceral quality that attracted me. And so I 
just keeps them. A, a little bat skeleton um, that I found in a chimney at a farm. Um, you know, the, the, uh, so the, to answer the question, almost anything that caught my eye that fascinated me and that wasn't alive. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So um, again, just a reminder, if you have questions from the audience, please, please include them uh, in the Q&A section. So uh, I'm going to ask kind of the, the difficult question that I know um, you and I have talked about a little bit before, and that's, that's about Jefferson. So I'm interested in this project's relation to Jefferson. Um, he shows up through, throughout the book in key places like Monticello and Natural Bridge um, and Poplar Forest. So um, how do you see his influence in your book and how or not, you know, how do you how do you avoid that uh, him? Um, and then how did this relationship between uh, you and your art and Jefferson, how did that relationship evolve through the project? I um, mean, you know, did did he did you forget about him at some point or, or how, how did that? So kind of that whole broad picture, you and Jefferson. Okay, well, um, you know, I mentioned that the original art project was Notes on the State of Virginia. That was his first book, his only book. Um, and I read that again. And um, I went to Monticello. I went to his retreat at Poplar Forest. Um, this is the assemblage I did on Jefferson. Um, and I went to Natural Bridge, which he owned. I did not set out to follow in his footsteps. Um, no. Uh, what I did do was use the Jefferson connection to create a historical arc, a way of understanding the present by referring to the past. Um, I, I talk about, in the book, I talk about Jefferson's visionary biocentric qualities. I mean, he, he had ideas about nature that were absolutely fabulous and um and yet i also have to address the slavery issue and i um speaking of making a comparison contrast with the past or that historical arc uh let me give you one example um i when i met was at poplar forest i entered the room where jefferson's granddaughters embroidered there's a big skylight of, of ahead. And I was standing there thinking, oh my goodness, 200 years ago, I would not have been able to pull on some jeans and go hiking up that hill outside that window. And I thought if I didn't have that historical context, that arc between the past and the present going on in this project, I wouldn't have been so aware of my um, ability to, to, to go out and, and be in the world as a woman artist. I really wouldn't, or as a, a contemporary person. Um, I, I even say like when I'm driving uh, down 64, you know, if Jefferson would have been on a horse and it would have taken him seven days to get where I'm going in a couple hours, you know, so that, that, that I think uh, puts things into perspective. And sometimes um, I'm interested in how the past becomes present. Let me find um, this section. This is the last, um, this is the last part of what the Mockingbird told me, which is a chapter on Jefferson, uh, on going to Monticello. And I've spent the day uh, touring the house exploring the forest around the area and um, then finally looking at the garden and meeting the head gardener there. And she ended up pulling up plants for me. And uh, <clears throat> this is the, at the very end, I'm, I'm exhausted from the day and I just, I have a pack full of plants, but um, I write, I rinse dirt off the carrots in a cast iron drinking fountain. The first thing to do back at the car was get the pea and nasturtium leaves in the plant press. And though zapped from cramming so much into one day, 
I use my last ounce of energy to get out pens, brushes, and watercolor. In the distance, a mockingbird strung phrases of other birds' songs together like beads on a necklace. Leaning over a pallet set up on the hood of my Subaru, I painted the carrots subtle shades of brick red and pale yellow. I took one last look at the carrots before eating them. They were still crisp and so sweet. So I'm making a, 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 vis a visceral connection between the past and the present, a including, the, I say this in the chapter uh, when, I, when the gardener first gives me the, the carrots, that there were different varieties of colors in carrots at the time. And so um, reddish ones, white ones, yellow ones, well, they still exist, but they're not as, as common. I love that both the, that story and, and the, the, the <clears throat> illustration. I, love, you know, I, I can taste and, and the carrots and feel your tiredness. I, I remember being at Monticello and just being exhausted by it all, but yet also just kind of exhilarated too. So yes, I, I really love that part. Um, I'm going to incorporate, um, kind of blend one of the, the questions from the audience with one, one of my own. Um, and the question from the audience is, um, what was the process of narrowing down which illustrations to keep and which to leave out? Uh, or did you simply um, do as many as you needed from a pre-planned section of the, you know, pre-planned idea of what you wanted to do? And, and, and that mine was kind of um, it, both illustration, well, no, let's just keep there. Let's just answer that. How did, how did you decide which illustrations to use? Um, well, uh, I, there were probably, um, that's probably 10 times the amount we actually could use for the book. Uh, and so we had to decide. It was a tough decision. Sometimes I want one and it, it just wasn't possible. Um, so like, here's an here's a, a illustration of one of the salamanders. Um, and so we could only use like one of them. We used some full pages. But um, the, the book designer, Rebecca Davison, did a fabulous job of integrating the sketches into the text. So they, I think they create a kind of dialogue um, or even further art with the text and the image, um, which was, which, and actually made us be able to use more drawings because if you, as you can see that the, the book page, if the book pages were used, it would have been just a limited amount or the book would have been so big. Um, yeah, and so, so the, to the, the short answer is there were a lot more and we had to narrow it down and to how it would tell the story in the chapter. Great, thank you. Uh, two people have, or maybe even three people have asked how you how they can buy the book, and um, that information will be available at the end. There'll be there is a discount um, if, if you buy it through uh, the Trinity University Press. So that that information will be at the end. Um, and the, another person is asking about the recording. Um, can the recording be shared with others? And I'm not sure about that. We'll we'll hear from one of our. Uh, sponsors on that um and, and the sponsor just said yes so uh this will be uh, it's being recorded right now and it'll be available through the trinity university press so and through youtube and facebook so um and that last question about the process of, of narrowing was from monica i don't know if he's how you pronounce her last name uh, h-o-e-l you might know her suzanne i'm going to ask a Oh, okay. Another question from the audience uh, is from um, Teresa Burris. Uh, what was the greatest challenge creating this book and what was the greatest joy? Um, the greatest challenge. The mosquitoes in the swamp. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were physical challenges. Yeah, mosquitoes uh, is definitely one. Um, one of the greatest challenges was to 
narrow down where I was going to go. Um, uh, there, there, Virginia is just so culturally and ecologically rich. I mean, every state ha is, but I mean, Virginia, you have you have the ocean, and then you have mountains, and a lot in between, and and culturally, just amazing. And uh, I mean, uh, it it it, it was really a, a process of 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 chiseling and comparing what I'd already done, you know, somewhere. Well, I've been to that swamp. I, I actually did two swamps, didn't I? Um, and, um, but for instance, in Richmond, I had so many ideas for Richmond. I decided I would do um, an outing, like an exploration uh, excursion at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. I have a background in art history. I constantly draw in museums and I draw a lot of creatures in museums. I thought, why not do that? And then, and this is what's interesting about this project. When I did created those drawings at the Virginia Museum of animals from Africa and South America and, and America and Europe, and then I looked around at the people in Richmond. I thought, this reflects all these people. This reflects the culture of all these people. And that I gained an idea from it while writing. Okay. You can you can get ideas when you're writing that you don't when you're thinking. Do you know what I mean? Do you ever so you you're working out the idea? Oh, who said? Somebody said, I think it was E.M. Forster, I don't know what I think until I write it. Um, so here I am thinking, oh, how interesting that, that all these people have this connection to the animals in their ancestral culture. And in a way it kept them, kept the, the museum keeps these connections on life support. So my greatest joy, were, for with writing the book were those kind of epiphanies. And, um, you know, it, it only comes when you write it out, when you when you're working on what what do you think? And then you, that's 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 a that's a real gift. Yes. Writing is discovery. Yes. So mm -hmm. um, and, and the other part of that question was the struggle. What was um, what was something that you really struggled with? Or did you did you answer that? I sort of answered that. OK, good. <laughs> uh, good. I, where to go? Should I read? I'll read that section. Because sure. I, yeah, I, I was. Yeah. Um, it, 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 I was going to ask, how did you decide where to go? Yeah. And that, okay. that leads to. OK, I, I tacked. A, uh, this is from the preface. I tacked a huge laminated map of Virginia on my studio wall to study the five geographical regions of the state, coastal plain, Piedmont, Blue Ridge, Valley and Ridge, Appalachian Plateau. After brushing up on how to read topographic maps, I searched for people with expertise on some aspect of Virginia, many of whom you'll meet in these pages. They added to the list of places already piquing my interest and then I winnowed possible sites down to those with particular resonance or locality in the state. Remember, I had to cover east to west, north to south. And if you look on the map, there is a little bit more around Southwest Virginia where I live, of course, but, um, but that was another consideration. Um, I winnowed down, I say that like it was easy, it wasn't. For example, the endangered species. I wanted to do one endangered species in one site where I would see an endangered species in Virginia. Wait, which one? For example, the, would it be the giant carrion beetle, the red cockaded woodpecker, or the bog turtle? All fascinated me. I finally chose the woodpecker for seeking it would take me to southeastern Virginia, where I'd find fields of cotton and peanuts a region I'd only seen through the windshield of a car. Another reason was the bird's curious life cycle, which if, I, if lucky, I might glimpse. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I did see the red cockaded woodpecker. 
I went to Piney Grove in Sussex County and um, in Southwest, Southeastern Virginia. And I met uh, the, the steward of the Nature Conservancy um, refuge there, uh, Bobby Klontz, who got up early in the morning. And I tell the story of that, uh, his taking me out to see the, the woodpeckers coming, emerging from their cavities in the morning. And that's really the only way you can be sure to see them. Um, phenomenal experience. I think that's, that was the moment when I was sitting with him on that log waiting and we were talking about the birds when I felt like Ken Burns and this camera crew might be behind me photographing this because I mean, it felt so incredible to be out there with Bobby who knew so much about the birds and the, and the pine forest. Um, and, and he did change something. He was the only one of the people who, who changed something about how I wrote of the people I mentioned in the book. And that was, I called the piece Losing Ground. And I would have called the chapter Losing Ground because they were endangered. And he said, no, they're really gaining ground because he's working on creating the habitat for more wood, woodpeckers. They're gaining ground. And I thought that was so interesting. So I changed the title of the piece and I, the chapter is called Gaining Ground. And those kind of experiences with people who are devoted to an animal or a habitat um, are, are really a, the uh, wonderful experiences um, and give me a lot of faith and a lot of hope in the future. And that comes through really well in your book. Yeah, that that's that really comes through. You you create the the characters of these people so that the reader feels that connection to yeah. That that was a real surprise um creating characters. I didn't know how much I would like describing characters. Um you know and you know I I I read a lot of fiction. Um and I read, of course, a lot of nonfiction, especially nature writing. But um, I, 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 was, I would think about, well, how to, how to convince somebody, I mean, how to, to make a reader see that person or understand that person without saying it um, really obviously. And um, you'll have to read the book to, to see how I do that. But that was a real surprise to me. I had never done that before. And I really got into it. I loved it. And it, it shows. It's great. Um, I'm going to ask a, a, another audience question from Nina Rizzo. Rizzo um, that kind of goes off of, of the last question that, that you just answered. Um, is there any particular place in Virginia that you explored that was so inspiring and complex that you felt that you didn't even scratch the surface, a place you feel you must return to? Oh, every single one of them. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I could have called the book "Scratching the Surface." Yeah, <laughs> seriously, every every place I would I would I would like to just live for you know a little while. And you know, it, part of it is I love waking up in the morning somewhere, not not planning a trip, just waking up and see what there is to explore. And at different seasons, I'd love to to explore places and. The winter or you know d different season than i than i was able to go there so yeah good question though i really like that question yeah yeah um i'm going to ask another uh audience question this one's from carol k condit um she says your nest assemblage on page 161 is marvelous uh, in the chapter nest making, you describe the components used in this creation. In general, do you have an affinity for bird nests? <laughs> I think that's pretty, knowing your work, I think that's. Uh, uh, yes, and you can see in the back there, there's a nest <laughs> that I'm looking at a painting. Um, so explore that. I do. Um, I mean, nest making, uh, you know, that chapter is about making an assemblage. Um, you know, when, when, you, when, when I thought about writing each chapter, uh, many of them are going out on excursions. You know, I 
I, I go somewhere, I explore, I collect a sketch and meet some people and I go home. But I thought, well, one chapter should really be about the studio experience. I mention it in many chapters, but that's the place where I really document making the assemblage from beginning to end. That's and your best. So the, exactly. It's, yeah. So I call the I call the chapter nest making, but it's also art. It could be art making, and um, yeah, I do have an affinity. For, and they're beautiful forms too. They're beautiful forms. They're um, species specific. N they never took a class in nest making birds. Um, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in fact, I heard one uh, an ornithologist um, sat his students down at a table with all sorts of nest materials, and he said, "By the end of the day, try to make it, make. I want you to have made a nest." And they couldn't do it. Like, how do they get? They they no glue, you know. I mean, maybe no spider webs like birds actually use sometimes. Um, you know, how do you get it to hold it together? You know, I. I, I admit in that nest, I glued it. Um, so uh, yeah, I do have an affinity with bird's nests and I also think of them as um, uh, very suggestive objects for our, our own creations. Do you, do you know the Thoreau quote about nest making? It, and I'm, I'm gonna butcher it. I, um, I'm, it's from Walden, I'm pretty sure. He says something about if, if uh, people could build their own houses as well as birds oh. make their own nests then what maybe what songs you know beautiful songs we could sing and and you know it it, it it's very much a butchering of that but um well i also think of um the the french philosopher gaston bachelard who wrote the poetics of space and he wrote and i'm going to butcher this quote too probably a nest is a precarious thing but it sets us to daydreaming about security. And I think that that's another interesting thing about nests. Um, they're actually very fragile. They're only used for, for laying eggs, except for the red cockaded woodpecker. That's really interesting. But, um, they, but, they, but when we look at them, we think about security. They create that kind of, you know, we have all sorts of phrases about nest making and, and uh, to, to mean that we're creating a, a kind of safe environment. So I find that paradox really interesting. Yeah. Um, I think we're gonna maybe do two more questions. This one's from an audience member. Um, Deanna Wilson wants to know what your next project is. And do you think that, yeah, this is ambitious. Do you think you'll do something similar for other states? Well, um, I'll tell you something funny. Um, when I had done 26 of these pieces, I felt like, I really felt like um, I could do it forever. I, I, I thought, oh, it was so much fun. <laughs> I mean, challenging fun, granted, but it was so, and you know, when you go out on a mission, you see more in some ways. Your mind becomes focused. Um, I talk a little bit on, in the preface about being sidetracked by design. That is, you know, you, you're focused on observing, but you also bring memories and, and scientific facts and you imagine and um, what I call focused daydreaming. Um, unfocused daydreaming means you're thinking about what you have to buy at the store when you get home or, you know, what somebody said to you in an email. No, that's like not there, right? You want to be there, but you want to be able to bring things in and, and weave that um, experience. So I, I really would, ima could imagine doing it again for Virginia, um, for another state, only if I moved there. Um, and, and, you know, Virginia really was my, my big backyard, so to speak. Um, so I would have to live there, but some people have said, oh, why don't you do Bartram's Trail or um, this or that. Uh, my my um, next project is um, a book about 
the studio experience and nature um, that I've been writing here and there and doing um, a series of turtle paintings. So that's what I'm working on now. I didn't know that. That's great to hear. Great. Um, so I'm going to um, end with, I, th I think it's, yeah, we should probably uh, wrap this up. Um, asking you to, to, you know, the, I love the, the section about the Luna moth and um, mm -hmm. feel that really embodies um, so much of this book. It, it, you know, it captures so much of your process and everything. So I'd love for you to read that. Okay. Okay, so I've spent some time in a cabin and um, I, I've, I discovered, it, I'm just giving you the context from uh, before the part I'm, I, I'm reading. And I've discovered a, a Luna moth outside on the porch that, that night. Now, morning, dazzling sun slanted through the cabin window, warming my face as if delivering news I'd have a clear day for exploring. While the tea kettle boiled, I pulled the chair from the doorknob, dashing out to see the moth. It hadn't budged. What seemed a ghostly vision the night before made me smile now, for it tucked its head down, as if slightly embarrassed to be a lump of white fur wearing green fairy wings. As I nudged my index finger against its head, it scuttled on and froze in a I'm a leaf pose as it rode my finger to the wooden kitchen table turned drawing board. A super fine pen line felt thick and clumsy lining those fragile wings. Maybe only paint could do their translucence and soft celadon hairs justice. The moth's large yellowish antenna told me it was a male, for those ferny receptors must be long to detect a female's pheromone from miles away. I'm gonna skip a little bit about the description of the moth and end this section with this. I placed the moth back on the porch where, um, while I explored the ridge. He'd be rested for his expedition after sunset. Now for mine. Along the trail, I collected crusty brown seed pods, beetle husks, and a small bit of bone gnawed by squirrels. Fence lizards fled my clomping hiking boots, dashing up rocks or tree trunks. From the tip of a sapling, a chipping sparrow threw its rusty capped head Chip, 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 chip. I remembered the red haired cashier at the nearby marathon station, slouching between rows of rental videos, despairing to his buddy that he had nothing to do, that this place was the middle of nowhere. Are you kidding? I thought, but said nothing, swiping my debit card for gas and talk coffee. Not his fault. We're taught to think that way. What a privilege it is to be astonished by the living world so that every place becomes the middle of somewhere. Yay, thank you. What a privilege it is to be in this conversation with you, Suzanne. Oh, thank you, you very much. Thank you so much, Jim. Sure. Um, so thanks to Suzanne, thanks to the Trinity University Press for hosting this and for putting this beautiful book out. Um, it's, it is a beauty. I hope you uh, buy it and enjoy it. Um, and thanks to the audience for coming and participating and for the great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. There were several that uh, we, we just didn't have time for. Um, so if you want to buy the book, The Middle of Somewhere, uh, as well as they're, they're, they're very generous and, and putting mine in this as well, uh, one, of my, one or two of my books, um, use the link in the chat. Uh, the Bergen has just put the chat, the info in the chat, and you'll receive 20% off, uh, but you have to use the promo code middle, since it's in the middle of some, nowhere, yeah, somewhere, uh, <laughs> M-I-D-D-L-E, and then 20, 2 and that's in the chat section. Um, so use that code in the checkout, and you'll get 20% off, and buy one for you, and one for 
your neighbor and one several for Christmas <laughs> gifts. They're they're great. Um, and if you want to know more about uh, events like this one, sign up at the, the University Press webpage. It's tupress.org. And again, uh, thank you. We're, we're getting great thank yous uh, from several people in the conversation. So I think, uh, Suzanne, this was a great, great birthing of your book. Um, oh, yeah. Tell, tell, um, Tell you're giving a reading as well. The in it, or is that already happened? I forget the, at at the um, birth birthplace. Oh, yeah, the, on Thursday night for local people, I'll be doing a um, presentation at the birthplace of country music at seven o'clock this Thursday night on March thirty first. So great. So if you're in in the in the Southwest Virginia region, you could go there. And uh, I'm assuming I haven't checked this out, but I'm assuming you have other readings lined up, right? I and do. That, that uh, you be... can you can go to my website uh, on the news page, and I I'll list them all there for Great. updates. And... Yes, terrific. Uh, do you have any last words to say, Suzanne? So, uh, well, if if anything, I I hope that this book makes people want to find their own somewhere and and find their own way of entering into place places that's a, that's a great way to end and somebody actually asked that question what do you hope to achieve with this book and that, mm -hmm. that would that's, please that's me very much <laughs> yeah so so go out everybody in the audience go out and find your own somewheres and thank and you yeah. and, and somehow um learn from them and, and even record them so mm -hmm. learn yeah. your own way of recording yeah 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 mm -hmm. terrific all right well thank you all Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming in tonight.